Thank you very much, John. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today um, to talk on uh, this topic. It's a very timely seminar. Um, this is a very crucial area for our country, I believe. Um, I'm delighted John also mentioned about <coughs> stopping phones. A very recent Prime Minister in, a, in an audience with Her Majesty the Queen, his mobile went off. This is a true story. And Her Majesty said to him, is it someone important? So one needs to be aware of the dangers of, uh, of things like that happening. Um, uh, as John mentioned, although I was involved in, in signals intelligence and electronic warfare for a number of years at sea, uh, and also particularly when I was Director of Naval Intelligence for three years and Chief of Defence Intelligence for three years when we had our, our meeting that, that, that I attended about critical national infrastructure, it wasn't really until I became a minister that I became fully aware uh, of the risks uh, to our nation and globally um, of the growing attacks uh, on all parts of our computer-connected infrastructure. It's interesting, for example, uh, when I was CDI, Chief of Defense Intelligence, one of the issues that I came across was an American hacker who actually had hacked into the American naval medical systems uh, on a whim and had changed over the blood groups. And luckily, very luckily, um, NSA had asked GCHQ to be monitoring certain areas, and CESG spotted this, because otherwise, the first operations the next day, we would have had dead people on our hands. And that was way back in about 1997, and things have got a lot worse since then, I can tell you. Now, what I found was that there had been a considerable amount of good work. It was being done by GCHQ, the CESG down there, within the security service, and we've mentioned them already, by the Center for Protection of Critical National Infrastructure, CPNI. Within the telecoms world, there was stuff being driven by the TSAC, the uh, Telecom Industry Strategic Advisory Council. Uh, some parts of the commercial world were giving some good advice and doing some good work. And there was useful advice, for example, being given by people like the IAC, the Information Assurance Advisory Council. But what really surprised me uh, is, uh, on becoming a minister, was to find that there was absolutely no overarching government policy. Our response uh, to what was an exponentially growing threat was very stovepiped, it was uncoordinated, and it was also clearly apparent to me that most of government uh, were very ignorant of the significance of the threat that was there, and certainly the senior political leaders. And this was clearly unsatisfactory, but you'd be amazed, I think, about how difficult it was for me to raise that awareness of our vulnerability and that the threat was growing, it was real and present danger in American terminology. And I was particularly grateful to CESG and actually also to British Telecom at GCHQ and Martlesham for doing a number of briefs and being able to get people in there. And I started pushing very hard for a UK cyber security strategy um, uh, in, the, in the middle of 2007 when I became the security minister. I had huge difficulty with other government departments and with the Whitehall bureaucracy. And for example, uh, for quite understandable reasons, biz were very nervous about my aims and what I was trying to do. The, the agenda to ensure that the private citizen, business and government were part of a very modern networked society, digital Britain, uh, to ease administration, commerce, enhance efficiency, save money, uh, made absolute sense. Absolutely, it was the right thing to do in our interconnected global economy. And of course, just today, you will have heard on, uh, on the news programs about how we're ahead of the world, apparently, in use of this digital, uh, this digital world. I think something like 18% of our GDP uh, is reliant on that and that we're ahead of anyone else in the world. But of course, it's that very ease of connection, the fact that these things are designed to enable you to connect, that's the whole point of them in these computers, that presented opportunities for the evil intentioned, be they state actors, criminals, hackers, or of course, potentially terrorists. Clearly, too restrictive a security regime would be self-defeating by stopping all of the real benefits that we get from rapid connectivity and the ease of use presented by these modern systems. Now, I finally actually only broke the logjam by actually calling in aid the Prime Minister himself, um, because I did have a direct link to him as he'd asked me to come in and look at these issues. And work started on the production of a policy in the middle of 2008. That's how long these things take to get going. And in addition, I ensured that the risk was captured in the national security strategy, because we put, produced that year the first one that's ever been produced. It was in the national risk assessment. This is a, a confidential assessment that is produced uh, which has all of the risks to our nation, uh, ranging from military risks right down to pandemics and everything. I ensured it was in there. And I also put it, 
parts of it onto the National Risk Register. This is an unclassified document, quite a useful document, primarily aimed at the local resilience forums and places like that, so they can actually prioritize risks within their regions and areas. And we also started raising awareness of the risks in, in public fora. Um, we had a growing number of examples of very serious attacks by state actors sucking IP out of major industrial concerns, and very often, of course, those concerns were unwilling to say that had happened. And we had to find out through other means that they had happened, um, which we were able to do. Huge numbers of attacks on telecoms providers. I think back then in those days, it was up to something like three or 4,000 a week on one particular provider, and you can get, guess the scale of all of that. Um, attempts to get into critical national infrastructure, but we were a little bit better placed in that ar arena, but there were attempts and uh, people were getting into there occasionally. An explosion in serious organized criminal activity, an exploitation of the web, and we touched on that earlier in one of the earlier uh, briefs, um, and of minor criminal activity, such as identity theft, and attack by misguided and malicious individual hackers, as, as I've already mentioned, which each time, of course, costs small companies money, costs big companies money. Now, notwithstanding all of this, there was an amazing lack of awareness in government and at board, I'm talking about boards of companies, an individual level about the threat. One factor was that there was no recognized figure for the, the cost of these attacks, and uh, Detective Superintendent McMurray has just touched on that, about how there's no real figure there, um, and various figures were quoted. But even Detica's report on the cost of cybercrime produced in 2011 was surrounded with an awful lot of caveats. I think just suffice it to say, the total cost globally is tens and tens of billions of pounds. And I'm forgetting, I'm not talking about security risks in this, I'm just talking about pure cost. This is immense. Now, internationally, the picture of, of interest in cyber was no better. The USA had talked the talk, um, but apart from NSA and the dot mill er arena, nothing was really being done despite President Obama's election pledges. And with the Department of Homeland Security being responsible for .gov and .com, .com that's unlike the UK, of course, where GCHQ is responsible for, for, for the .gov bit, um, uh, there were yawning gaps in what was a very old system because, of course, the Americans had gone into this computer world when we were still using quill pens, and that meant, of course, they had very old systems and lots of vulnerabilities. And, for example, when we looked at the gateways, the abilities to get into their government system, uh, we stopped when we had found 9,000 of them. The Americans asked us to stop finding any, uh, and they, of course, have started rectifying those problems, uh, whereas our GSI.gov is a much more, much more tightly... Uh, uh, and much more tightly controlled. I haven't got time to go into the whole issue of cyber command, the difficulties of setting up cyber command, but it is a very interesting area uh, if one wants to uh, look into that to see the difficulties the Americans have had. The EU um, absolutely just had their heads in the sand. I, I found going to Brussels a, a pretty awful experience, to be quite honest, because they just actually saw, they just didn't realize what the problem was. It's better now, but it was pretty awful back then uh, I can tell you, it's like telling jokes over there as well, which we get wrong. I remember a, a British general telling a joke at the time of the Iraq War where he said, why can't you make soldiers... Uh, well, no, what's, what's, the, what, what, what's the difference between toast and, and, and Iraqis? He said, you can make soldiers out of toast. Well, no one in Europe actually makes soldiers out of toast, so it fell absolutely flat. So I, I realise the difficulties and dangers of when you're, when you're making these sort of things abroad. Now, in 2009... The cybersecurity strategy of the United Kingdom hit the streets. As was mentioned by John, uh, I was made the first ever Minister of Cybersecurity. The, the best thing about that was that my son, my, one of my sons, thought it was a magnificent title and thought I was something from Star Wars. Um, and I was based in the Cabinet Office for that work. The, the key achievement, I think, in that policy were actually articulating the threat more clearly, raising awareness of people, because as I mentioned, it was not there, and ensuring cross-government coordinated response, which was absolutely necessary and needed. We established the Office of Cyber Security, the OCS, and the Cabinet Office, and that was to ensure strategic leadership and coherence across government. We established the Cyber Security Operations Center down in GCHQ, which to give an operational focus for this, but there was an awful lot of work still to do in terms of engaging with industry, uh, and, of course, that, there are a myriad of issues involved with that. Looking into the legal and ethical aspects of cybersecurity, not least the problems because of difficulty of attribution, uh, legislation that we might want to push through in terms, of, in terms of cyber, retaliation, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, how, how is that uh, governed and authorized. There were a whole area of human behavioral aspects, 
uh, 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 and Sadie didn't really touch on that too much in her, in, in her lecture, but I, uh, she's got some very interesting takes on that, and it'd be worth talking to her later on, I think, on that, and so on. So there's awful, an awful lot to do. Um, and, of course, there was the international engagement, and one chunk of that OCS focused on international engagement because, like it or not, you know, we are, this, in the area of cyber, we really are a tiny little global village. You can't operate out, outside of that. And there was also a need to tie in the Ministry of Defense uh, into all aspects of cyber warfare, which they're just beginning to get to grips with. Now, in 2010, the coalition produced the third national security strategy. This highlighted the threat from cyber, the importance of cyber. They elevated it that much more, which I'm very glad they did. And they found 650 million to move it forward. Not very much, but my goodness me, when you're broke, that's quite a lot of money. It showed a sort of focus and how important it was. And this was followed in November 2011 uh, by an updated cybersecurity strategy, the UK cybersecurity strategy protecting, promoting the UK in a digital world. So what's my take on where we've got to? Well, first, I consider that although somewhat subjective, uh, subjective McAfee's uh, recent assessment of the least and most vulnerable nations is broadly correct in showing the UK as one of the best practitioners and China, notwithstanding their attacks on an industrialist scale, and I'm quite willing to mention their name because I think it's appalling, uh, one of the worst. It is quite a surprise that China is so vulnerable and of course it does beg the question, which I touched on earlier, of what action should we take, we or the US or other countries take, in response to continuous attacks that despite difficulty of attribution we know come from China. You know, should we actually think about going back down there and destroying computers? We can, we're quite capable of doing that. Should we actually think of taking them through the courts? Well, we need legislation and we need an international agreement if we're going to do that. Should we actually just use it for intelligence purposes? We're quite capable of doing that. But it does raise this whole raft of questions, all of which have to be addressed. However, although I believe we are ahead of most nations in terms of cyber awareness and information assurance, I am extremely worried that there is a lack of urgency still in this country, a real lack of urgency, because we've achieved some things, and, uh, and there's a lack of desire and ability to move this agenda forward and protecting our very numerous and growing vulnerabilities, and they are growing, I'm afraid, and it was touched on by some of the previous speakers, against what is a, a hugely growing and constantly morphing threat, that constantly morphing threat. It's that cha those changes which happen so quickly that is so dangerous, and we need to do more. We need to do it more rapidly, and if we don't, I believe we're going to run out of options with possibly catastrophic, catastrophic effects. As an aside, and at lower levels, it's, it's amazing to me that there are still boards, I know because I go and sit on the odd board here and there, uh, where cybersecurity and information assurance are not included in the risk register. I find that amazing today. Uh, and in terms of information assurance, I believe in the company it should have clarity of objectives, clarity of accountability, resources aligned with that accountability, clear plan incorporating IA, high quality IA people, support from the main board, and there you are, that's free advice to any board you know, uh, chiefs who are here. But back to where we are now. The Office of Cybersecurity uh, has been renamed the Office of Cybersecurity Information Assurance. It has grown in authority uh, and, and in power as well, and I think that's very good. That's good news. Uh, defense now has its Defense Cybersecurity Plan uh, and the Global Operations and Security uh, Control Center at Corsham using Watchtower, already proving its utility on a daily basis. Uh, there's a joint cyber unit at Caution, a joint cyber unit at GCHQ. We've established the Cyber and Influence S&T Center, and I think that's a great step forward, uh, and I have great hopes for what that might achieve in the future. Um, the Cyber op uh, Security Operations Center at GCHQ, the one is, that I established, has developed, and all of actions, military or civil, are led from there. And having said that, although cyber attack in war will need to be run through GCHQ, it will be under military chain of command. A joint government industry cyber security hub is going to be set up to establish a framework for best practice, and the pilot for that has already been running. Some of you may well have been involved. It's got the Ministry of Defense, financial, telecoms, pharmaceuticals, and energy sectors involved, and that should roll out uh, any day now. Uh, Detective Superintendent McMurdy mentioned the national crime well, she actually mentioned the e-thing, but then stems the national crime strategy. Uh, and I have to say, those e-crime units, I think the, the movement forward in that area has been very, very good indeed, and very well done on that, if I may say so. But my goodness me, 
we need to do even more there. There's no doubt about it. And with 30 million injected um, for, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for those areas, it's not really enough. But there isn't much money around, but we really need to move that forward. But it is a really step, a good step forward. I start, kick-started it three years ago, just at the end of my time. But the coalition has moved that forward, and that's very good news. Each government department has been tasked with producing its own cyber plan. There is an embryo national cyber instant response plan. Um, the banking sector seems to have firmly understood the problem. The FSA have run a number of exercises, including involvement of the Biz uh, Secretary of State in, cyber, in the cyber storm exercises. But there have been very serious attacks on commercial banks, stock exchanges, commodity exchanges, private equity, hedge funds, and in that area, I can assure you, there is a very understandable reluctance to report incidents, which is quite difficult because it means you can't get to grips with them and move forward. But you can quite understand why some of those things I've named, they're not at all happy to let someone know that they've actually had a real, real problem. I think it's of interest for those in that area, the US threat matrix which has been produced uh, for the banking is, I think, of some value and worth looking at. There's also a considerable debate about personal ID methodology. For example, what's the best method to ensure uh, security while allowing maximum utility and flexibility of a given system? You know, should it be identity or what should it be? A lot of debate in that arena, um, which I think is valuable. Um, now, I know I'm running out of time, so I've got to gallop. So what are some other things that need addressing? Well, standards. Should government set certain criteria? Should there be regulation? I don't like regulation, actually, I have to say. I'm an unusual person who served in the Labour government. I think too much regulation is dreadful. Is there any merit in kite marking? Again, I don't think so, but there are quite a lot of people who are attracted to the idea. Do we think there's sufficient clarity of advice as to what security mechanisms should be in place for major IT systems? Should there be some form of procurement advice given, by government, uh, given to government departments and to industry by some central body? How should we identify companies providing robust and good protection and help spot what we might call the snake oil salesman? We need much greater public awareness. Things such as get safe online are, are very good, but more needs to be done. Basic individual security, uh, hygiene protects against the vast majority of low-gate threats. Um, although I have to say it was interesting, some of the work we did some four years ago on memory sticks and leaving memory sticks lying around, although Sadie mentioned good-looking girls, we did find that if you put shoes on there that women open it straight away. Um, so that's a real problem there. So we all have our vulnerabilities, don't we, in this sort of thing. Uh, also, as Sadie said, uh, the whole issue of cloud technology and how we go ahead on that, um, I mean, there are some real, real issues we've got to grapple with there and the issue of apps as well. I mean, these are, these are real, we've got to think in new ways about these. These are critical things. And it comes back to this thing that I don't think we're moving forward as quickly as, as we should. I haven't really, I touched very briefly, I just mentioned terrorism. I haven't really talked much about it because although the, the terrorists have shown huge aptitude for using the web for radicalization, there actually have been very limited use of cyber attacks. Um, I just can't see that situation remaining so for long. And I'm sure we will have to take uh, firmer steps to guard against such attacks, particularly on critical national infrastructure, which they might do in conjunction with some kinetic attack. I'm sure this will develop, and I, I know CPNI are very aware of that, and I'm, but I'm sure something like that will happen. Um, one thing that Sadie didn't touch on, but I've mentioned already once, is this issue of human behavior, uh, and maybe the use of contractual agreements to manage risk. I think that area is an area that is absolutely fascinating. Not enough work has been done in the past, so ping her later on. I'm giving her lots of extra work here, so that'll, that's all good news. Um, well, I hope I've given a, a quick overview of uh, how government has got to where it is today. Um, I haven't had a red flag yet, so I think I've done it just in time. Um, and there's some of my thoughts on this. Um, as I say, this is such an important area. I'm so glad that there are conferences like this people like you who know something about this, we really do have to get to grips with this, this, this because our lives, our entire lives now, depend on this connectivity. Um, our wealth, actually our ability to survive almost, and we've got to get this right. Thank you very much.